Well done if you tuned in exactly at 6 p.m. our new time. Unfortunately, we were about three minutes late. That was because of technical issues, not because we had forgotten um, that we were starting an hour earlier. Of course, for the first time ever, you're not watching Tisky Sour, you're watching Navara Live. Ash, are you excited for your Navara Live debut? I'm very excited, but I'm also bitterly disappointed at the lack of confetti cannons, sparklers, or um, those little uh, party things which go like... Is that like, like a mini Vuvuzela? Could we call that potentially? Yeah, the ones that kind of unfold like um, in a Oh, I like, okay, tongue. that's not, yeah, I like those ones. I like those ones. No, Fox has banned all of that. He's a no nonsense guy. He said it's new, new name, new time. Doesn't need to be a fuss. You know, I would, I would have, I would have gone for something slightly bigger, but I respect the guy, I respect his opinion. So, so there we are. Um, we have a big show lined up for you, though. We're talking about the biggest strikes ever in the NHS, Liz Truss's return, and a very interesting interview from a former Israeli prime minister um, about attempts to reach a ceasefire um, at the start of the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, One big important story we're not going to be talking about tonight is the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, and we will be coming back to that later in the week. In the biggest strike to hit the NHS ever, hundreds of thousands of nurses in England are taking industrial action alongside ambulance workers. It's the first time that both workforces have walked out together. In Wales, a number of strikes were called off as the government made a new pay offer. There are no strikes in Scotland either because the Scottish government is negotiating with the unions. But in England, there doesn't seem to have been any progress, hence the strikes. Pat Cullen is General Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing. She's spoken to GMB's Susanna Reid. How come we're no closer to getting a deal? Well, I think that's a question you need to put to Rishi Sunak. Mm. Uh, I wrote to him on Saturday, um, and again, I'm waiting on a response and I haven't got one. And I think that says um, a lot, given that um, he knows that we are taking strike action today. What did you say in your letter to him? I said to him, look, that he can stop the the, the strikes happening. Mm -hmm. He can get round a table and start talking to me. It's now weeks since I've heard from anyone um, in his government, um, knowing that today and tomorrow is happening. And um, I did um, say clearly to him that he must start to talk to me. He is punishing nurses now in England. Mm -hmm. These nurses are now paid um, the worst Um, across the UK when you look at what's happened in Wales and Scotland. And is that fair? It most certainly isn't. It's interesting you make that um, comparison to Wales because there does seem to be progress in Wales uh, over nurses' pay. Um, What is the difference between what's happening in Wales and England? Well, we're getting round a table and we're talking. Mm. And we always said in the Royal College of Nursing that when an offer was put on the table, that we would trust our members and put that offer to our members. Mm. And during that period, we would cancel any strike action. So you've That's called exactly off, what we've done. You've called yes. off the strike action in Wales. The renewed pay offer from the Welsh Government was an extra 3% on top of the 4.5% already tabled. Do you get any indication that... Steve Barclay or Rishi Sunak might consider that? And would that mean an end to the nurses' strikes in England? It's very hard for me to answer that because for the three meetings that I've had with Steve Barclay, Mm -hmm. he's made it very clear, in fact, abundantly clear, we'll talk about anything but but, uh, the dispute and strike action and pay. For the government, Maria Caulfield spoke to GMB. She's a health minister and also a qualified nurse. Are you ruling out right here, right now, a revised pay offer? Absolutely. We want to give nurses a pay rise. The Prime Minister has said that. And that's why we're asking them to come to the table so that we can, from April, look at their pay. And that will take into account things like inflation, recruitment, <laughs> retention. That, that is the process right. that, that's so involved. only from April and nothing before then. Well, you know, nurses have had a 4.5% pay rise. You know, I lived through the pay cap and the pay freeze as a nurse and worked really strongly with the RCN on that. And absolutely, we recognise uh, that nurses needed a pay rise. That's why we respected uh, the, the recommendations from the pay review okay. body. So the issue here is that the government in England isn't prepared to talk about pay for the current year. And that means that the 4.5% nominal pay rise nurses were offered for 2022 to 23 will remain. And it, of course, remains a large real terms pay cut. 
Sharon Graham is General Secretary of Unite, which represents many ambulance workers, one of the unions that represents them. Um, on Sunday, she spoke to the BBC's Laura Koonsberg. What is going on in Wales? There are some unions that have paused the strikes. Why won't you do the same? Well, look, I'm in Wales and I have been um, all uh, weekend trying to get to the deal that we need to give to our members uh, to solve the dispute. Um, we're not there yet. The reality is we are not there yet. What we need to happen now is for Wales to come back to the table, which uh, I'm meeting the health minister later on today in order for us to see if we can get a deal. But I think the important thing, Laura, to say is it's in stark contrast, Scotland and Wales, to what is happening in England. And I've just heard the interview with Grant Chapman it's the eve of the biggest NHS strike in our history um, and he has absolutely nothing to say about it. Where is Rishi Sunak? Why is he not at the negotiating table? That's where he should be and that's what we're calling on him to do. He did have something to say though to our viewers. He said that you are putting lives at risk and patients will be harmed by your decision to walk out. Well, this, this government is putting lives at risk. So let me just give you a stat. Um, 500 people are dying every single week. 500 waiting for an ambulance. So what we're trying to do is that we are trying to, yes, get pay, of course, because we need to solve the workforce crisis, but we're also trying to make sure that patients are much safer than what, what, they, what they are. It's almost like there's a strike in the NHS every single day. We've got 130,000 vacancies. So we're doing our very best to try and solve this dispute, but it's gonna take more than that. It's gonna take investment in the NHS also. That figure of 500 deaths a week comes from a senior medic who is also head of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. The NHS England dispute it, but other healthcare experts have endorsed it. Nurses who are members of the Royal College of Nursing will be on strike again tomorrow, whereas ambulance workers will walk out again on Friday. And on Thursday, NHS physiotherapists are on strike. What the picture of negotiations has looked like across the other nations, in particular Scotland and of course Wales, shows you just how intransigent the Westminster government are being. You don't have strikes in Scotland today, you don't have strikes in Wales today. That means that people can go about using NHS services without um, being afraid that they won't be able to access some of the crucial emergency care that they need. Now, of course, they're NHS services are underfunded too and you have a beds crisis in Wales and in Scotland as well but you don't have the added pressure of industrial action being loaded onto those services because their governments have taken a very different tack. Now if you want to explain why Westminster is being so reckless in their approach to negotiations um, it, it's quite simple. Steve Barclay, the Health Secretary and the Treasury are at loggerheads about the question of, well, where would funding for increased nurses pay, increased paramedics pay, increased doctors pay come from? The Treasury are saying, well, you're going to have to find it from your already existing budgets. Um, that means that you're going to have to take it out of things like capital spending or cut back on day-to-day -day spending elsewhere. And you know, quite understandably, if you're working in the Department of Health and Social Care, you're like, mm, don't think that's going to work, mate. So you have a political conflict, which is uh, really rending the heart of the Conservative Party at the moment. And it's people who are working in the NHS who aren't getting the kind of pay offers which can seriously meet their needs in a cost of living crisis. And of course, patients, people who use the NHS or might use the NHS who are suffering because of it. One of the big dirty words at the moment for the Conservative Party is tax, right? They are fundamentally split on this issue about whether they should, you know, keep some of the Johnson Sunak era increases in things like corporation tax and national insurance. And of course, we're going to talk about this um, shortly, I imagine, uh, the, you know, ghastly spectre of Liz Truss being like, we could just borrow to give tax cuts to the rich. Um, but even with the uh, you know Johnson Sunak era tax increases in the in national insurance and uh, in corporation tax, that's not enough to deal with the really expensive problems which have been left behind by over a decade of austerity. You of course have a staffing crisis because of how much the pay packets of NHS staff uh, has been devalued. You have increased demand for NHS services because we've got a growing population and aging population. And because of austerity, health outcomes 
particularly in deprived places, have gotten worse. Um, and you've also had the Lansley era reforms, the internal competition, which has made things in many ways a lot more dysfunctional within the NHS. Now, these are really expensive problems to fix and having a bean counting approach to money is absolutely not how you're going to address any of it. And trying to you know, grab more from workers' pay packets isn't going to do it either. Now, there is another option, which we talk about on the show an awful lot, which is taxing wealth. You tax assets, you tax estates, you can tax land value, you can tax property portfolios, you can bring capital gains tax in line with income tax. These would all be things which would, number one, raise as much, if not more money than the increase uh, to national insurance, which was first proposed under the Johnson government. And secondly, it's a much more more fair distribution of the tax burden. It's not something which is being applied equally to all earners. It's something which falls on the shoulders of the rich and the wealthy. But the Conservative Party are thinking to themselves that they're really out of political capital because they fucked it from every single angle. They've displeased the hardcore Johnsonites by defenestrating him. They've de you know, they've really annoyed the low tax contingent because, you know, they had to get rid of Liz Truss and, you know, take the sharp scissors away from her and stick her with the prit sticks and the glitter glue. Um and they've got very little political capital, political cover, and they're completely unmoored from a sense of vision. So I think that what we're seeing with the NHS strikes is in some ways a symptom of this wider malaise within the Conservative Party um, and and, and not simply a, a story in itself, if that makes sense. What blame does the West share for the continuation of the war in Ukraine? According to Vladimir Putin, we should bear most of it. He says it was the expansion of NATO that provoked Russia into a war of self-defence. On the other side, the UK, the US and Ukrainian governments say Putin's account turns reality on its head. They say Russia is fighting an imperialist war against its neighbour and the West has simply helped Ukraine defend itself. Now, personally, I think it's pretty indisputable that Russia is fighting an imperialist war. But whether the West are acting in the interest of a sustainable peace is much more questionable. And a key area under dispute is whether the West blocked the possibility of a ceasefire in March last year. That's been heavily contested ever since. But the mediator in those talks has now spoken publicly about what exactly occurred in those crucial meetings between Ukraine and Russia. He's the former Prime Minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett. נגיד את זה בצורה הרחבה, אני חושב שהייתה החלטה של המערב לגיטימית שכרגע צריך להמשיך להכות בפוטין ולא לא, לא להגיע. אבל מה זה להכות בפוטין? פוטין היכה באוקראינה, לא? שנייה, לא, בסדר, אבל, אבל שאל מול, זאת אומרת, הגישה היותר תקיפה, כן. אני אגיד לך משהו. אני לא יודע להגיד שהם שגו. כי אתה אומר, אולי, אולי ש... בריונים אחרים בעולם היו רואים... העמ... זה... העמדה שלי באותו הזמן, אני... בעניין הזה זה לא אינטרס לאומי ישראלי. כן. בשונה מקונסוליה או איראן, שאני דואג לישראל, עומד חזק פה, כן. אין לי say. אני בסך הכל כן. אה, מוציא לפועל ומתווך, אבל אני... הכתובת שלי זה אמריקה בעניין הזה. ואני לא פועל על דעת עצמי. כל פעולה שעשיתי הייתה מתואמת כן. לפרטי פרטים, גם עם ארה״ב, גם עם גרמניה, גם עם צרפת. אז הם בעצם חדלו את זה? בגדול, כן. בגדול הם חדלו את זה, ובאותו זמן חשבתי שהם שוגים. בדיעבד, מוקדם לדעת. Naftali Bennett's own YouTube channel. And the deal Bennett was talking about there would have involved Putin giving up on toppling Zelensky and allowing Ukraine to arm itself. So that's denazification in their words, of course, and demilitarization. Bennett is saying he would have given up those. Ukraine, in turn, would have renounced its ambition to join NATO. Now, Bennett said both Putin and Zelensky were willing to come to such a deal, but the West decided on a more aggressive stance and blocked it. As for divisions within the West, Bennett said that, quote, Boris Johnson adopted the aggressive line, Macron and Schultz, that's the French and German leaders, were more pragmatic, and Biden was both. To discuss the significance of the claims made in that interview, I spoke to Branko Marshatich, who writes on US foreign policy in the Ukraine war for Jacobin magazine. 
this suggests, uh, and there's one more data point that, that adds to, to the fact that, that uh, there is a significant number of, of nations in the, the NATO uh, uh, alliance who view the Ukraine war uh, as, as something of an opportunity to try to uh, weaken Russia as part of a larger geopolitical strategy. Um, and so for their purposes, uh, ending the war uh, earlier um, and, and with less bloodshed on, on each side was inconvenient. Um, it, it, it meant that Russia would not have suffered the kind of uh, catastrophic uh, casualty numbers and the destruction of equipment and so on and so forth that it suffered uh, over the course of this war. There's two questions. Did the West advise against a peace deal? And then what were their motives in doing so? And I suppose you've put forward there the cynical motives. They want to bleed Russia dry, so they're actually quite keen on a war continuing. I suppose the less cynical version would be they're saying, look, there's no point in signing any kind of ceasefire deal with Vladimir Putin because all he'll be using this to do is to buy some time so he can build up his troops and ultimately get what he wants, which is um, sort of the, the imperial overthrow of any kind of autonomous Ukraine. I mean, what, what do you make of that argument? There's a bunch of things that you could you could say uh, are motivating it. I mean, you know, Bennett himself says that that one motivation also is the idea of sending a message to other aggressive states that you know if they uh, launch an invasion, well, you know, it's going to cost them. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm going to say it's not the it's the it's the only thing that's going on here. But again, I mean, you know, the more cynical explanation is not something that I'm inventing here or kind of just speculating. I mean, again, there have been reports explicitly kind of saying this. Uh, and, you know, you might think back to, to uh, for instance, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Lord Austin saying uh, way back uh, early last year, saying that, you know, the, the plan here was to, to uh, weaken Russia, uh, you know, so it can't do this kind of thing again. Or, you know, you might think also to the, uh, the, the Ukrainian Pravda report uh, last year uh, where Boris Johnson uh, you know, flew to Kiev uh, uh, with, with no uh, previous announcement, you know, suddenly appeared there uh, saying that, you know, look, we're not going to recognize any sort of result in negotiations uh, uh, that Zelensky and, and Putin uh, uh, come to. Instead, what we're going to do is we think Putin's shown that he's weak and we should press him. So there's there's various you know, reporting that's been out there that suggests that the, the more cynical read is part of what is going on. It's not the only motivation. I think I think you're right what you've mentioned is probably also in the mix. I think what Bennett was saying, this idea of kind of trying to signal to other uh, invading states uh, what might happen to them, uh, uh, I think is also part of it. But I, I think, you know, unfortunately, there, there is a little bit of uh, cynical geopolitical maneuvering going on here, I'm afraid. I came across this interview via Twitter. Um, and when I was looking for it in sort of mainstream reporting, there were lots of people who had written up Naftali Bennett saying that Putin had said he wouldn't kill Zelensky. That seems to be the bit that the Western media is covering. But no one seems to be mentioning at all this idea that, you know, a, a deal was about to be reached, but then the West scuttled it. Um, now, you know, they might not accept that. They might say that there are two sides to this argument, but they seem to be completely ignoring it. What do you make of that? Well, I think it's a very inconvenient fact. I mean, I think for one, it, it doesn't. We, we've been sold this war as you know, basically a war of, of good versus evil, where you have NATO on the side of good, and you know, Russia on, on the side of evil. And you know, I think this kind of points to the, the the much more complicated reality, which is that you know, it's not quite that black and white. You know, our side, the the, the good guys, uh, sometimes do things that are, are not good, so that, that, that are very uh, deleterious to to both the interests of, of, you know, working people in those countries and to Ukrainians themselves, um, you know, and, and you know, uh, you think about, say, the, the invocation of Ukrainian agency throughout this war, which has often been used and I would say almost exclusively been used um, to, to uh, only uh, make arguments that are in furtherance of the war. Um, well, you know, you never hear uh, agency being invoked when early in the war, um, you know, and as late as I would say, you know, May and June last year, uh, Zelensky was uh, constantly talking about how the war was going to end in peace talks, uh, how, how negotiations had to happen, how he wanted the West to be more involved in negotiations. Even even when uh, Bucha was was discovered, uh, he said, you know, this is going to be more difficult, but ultimately talks are going to going to be the way it ends um all of that th this interview kind of busts uh every one of those things and you know it shows that that you know i think again agency is being invoked very cynically but more importantly i think people aren't being informed about 
what exactly at different points in this conflict uh, Ukrainian uh, leadership has wanted and, and what actually Ukrainian agency has meant. The discussion we're having now, a response from many people watching might be, look, you're, I know you've said that sort of Ukrainian agency is invoked in an opportunistic way, but it's also pretty clear that, you know, the majority of support in Ukraine does want to continue fighting this war, or at least doesn't want to make serious concessions to Russia. One of the reasons is um, because of the huge human rights violations that have been committed in that country. Obviously, one of the reasons talks were scuppered was because of the revelations from Bucha of, of war crimes. So how would you respond to, to that? Well, I mean, Bucha was definitely a factor. And, and that's another one of these uh, 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 points that I think makes what and it's saying a lot more uh, believable because, in fact, that was one of the points in the in the Pravda report uh, in last year that, that it wasn't just the the appearance of Johnson; it was also the discovery of Butcher um, that made selling a peace deal uh, with Russia domestically for Zelensky much more difficult. You know, but I think what that points to is, you know, do we know that that a possible peace deal would have uh, held? Uh, given given the discovery of that atrocity, no, we don't. But uh, it it does suggest that that for it to have happened, uh, Zelensky needed the political support of his Western partners, and they were not willing to give it to him. And you know, uh, we'll we'll unfortunately never know whether this war could have been ended, you know, weeks into the conflict. Um, but it, it 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 to me it seems like a real lost opportunity that that it wasn't tried and and the fact that you know that that Johnson did make the trip that that Bennett says that you know ultimately uh, the, the Ukraine's Western partners did uh, basically veto this deal I think it shows that they uh, the, the the countries that wanted the war to continue they did think that it could have uh, could have conceivably come to an end there. Um, and it wasn't a, a a risk they were willing to take. So you know, I think it's a real tragedy. It's a tragedy for the world. It's a it's a tragedy for Ukraine, most of all. No one in Britain has missed Liz Truss, but as someone who cares little for public opinion, that hasn't stopped Britain's shortest serving prime minister mounting an attempted comeback. She's penned a four thousand word article for the Sunday Telegraph with this headline: "Truss, I was brought down by the left wing economic establishment." Now, given she was brought down by the financial markets, it's a bit like Corbyn coming to power, getting overthrown by the trade unions and saying he was brought down by the right-wing economic establishment. This is, uh, the markets are not left-wing. Um, let's have a look at what she wrote. In the essay, Truss wrote this. I had always assumed that Boris would fight the next general election in 2024. Standing for the leadership myself was a faraway prospect. And as a result, I didn't have any kind of infrastructure in place for the contest on which the starting gun had just been fired. So this is her, you know, essentially saying the reason I was crap is because I didn't have any preparation. That is a flat out lie. So basically everyone in Westminster seems to say Liz Truss had been plotting a leadership bid for months. So no one is buying this idea that she was completely taken by surprise because she was so committed to her job as foreign secretary. She was known to have been maneuvering for a very long time. So that excuse um, falls flat. Most of the article is about the aftermath of the mini budget. And Liz Truss claims no one warned her about the effect, a sell-off of government bonds could have on pension funds. And she also said the OBR and Treasury are institutionally in favour of higher taxes and spending. Now, looking back at 12 years of austerity, that doesn't seem especially plausible. You know, that, that's not what these institutions have been promoting for 12 years. Truss's enemies weren't just limited to within the UK's borders, though. So she wrote, the high spend, high tax policy view does not just prevail in the UK. We were also swimming against the international tide. There was a concerted effort by international actors to challenge our plan for growth. The IMF commented on distributional aspects rather than market stability, which it is hard to conclude was anything but politically motivated. Then there was the intervention from President Biden, who publicly voiced his disagreement with our economic policy, stating, quote, I wasn't the only one that thought it was a mistake. These interventions were sadly in tune with growing efforts on the world stage to limit competition between G7 economies, as evidenced by the proposed global minimum tax rate. Um, now, I would dispute the commitment of these institutions to having uh, minimum tax rates and stopping corporations basically taking us all for a ride by forcing us to pursue a, a race to the bottom when it comes to taxes. But, you know, if they were to do that, great. Um, so I, I don't think many people are on Liz Truss's side where we need to determine policy so that corporations can have absolute free reign to pit governments against each other.
In any case, let's have a look at a video interview, because as well as penning this article for the Sunday Telegraph, Liz Truss has spoken to The Spectator. It goes back to the point about why have we not won the argument for the past 10 years Mm. about keeping taxes low, giving people more control of their own money, cutting business regulation. Why have we not won those arguments? Because we have tried to placate, you know, a lot of the the distributionists. And those are people in Britain who think the pie isn't going to get any bigger. The only economic debate is about how we divide it between different people. I fundamentally don't agree with that. I think if you have lower taxes right across the board, the country becomes more successful and that benefits everybody. And I think that's the argument we fundamentally haven't won. It was I trying to fatten the pig on market day, maybe. You know, there's a long history of failing to make the case. <laughs> and you know, that's that's what I'm thinking now. I'm thinking how can how can we make that argument? Because it certainly isn't going to make our country successful in the long term, having ever higher taxes, always having the argument that you can't cut the it's never a good time to cut the top rate of tax. You haven't won the argument because the evidence isn't in your favour. Now, you know, I know we we don't come from a position where we say sort of like whatever wins out in the public sphere is the most correct because I think we recognise that public debate is skewed by things such as corporate power of the media. You know, m- most mainstream media in this country is not in favour of tax rises because it's owned by billionaires, right? But if you are supporting low taxes, if you're supporting those policies, which all of these oligarchs are also supporting, then what is your explanation for why everyone's been misinformed that actually um, tax cuts aren't necessarily going to lead to growth and make all of us richer? Because if you look at comparisons, most of the countries which have faster growth than us also have higher taxes than us. The only country you can really look at to support Liz Truss's argument is the United States. And the United States is a very different kettle of fish um, from the UK. If you look at France, Germany, Scandinavia, higher standards of living, higher tax rates. So it's not just some bizarre blob left-wing economic establishment which is telling people that tax cuts aren't what we need now. It's just looking around the world, right? Truss was also asked about the impact of her mini-budget on mortgage rates. There will also be some people who will be listening, watching this and saying, well, actually, look at, look at the way your premiership ended, look at um, the, the market turmoil. Um, you know, perhaps those people had to renew their mortgages at that time. And yes, there were global factors. Um, and they were saying, well, are you the right person to be making the case for growth? And I wonder, what would you say to them? Well, first of all, on the mortgage point, I do want to address this because the, we've been living in a very low interest rate world. And mortgage rates have been going up. And the reason there was a specific issue around the time we're talking about in September, a lot of it is to do with the liability-driven investments and the impact they had on the market. So I don't think it's fair to blame interest rate rises on on, on what we did. I think that's unfair. The Bank of England um, said it was a 50-50 mix. I think they showed a graph saying half of it was global factors, half of it was UK factors. I mean, would you think that's... Well, I'm not saying... But on the UK factors, I don't believe... Well, there are, I believe there are other UK yeah, right. factors apart from... So they were, they, were, they were more about the pension issues than there were your major budgets. Well, I'm just saying mm. that that that, that, you know, that is definitely an issue. And, of course, we, we are seeing mortgage rates go up. So, I mean, we can argue until the cows come home about exactly why mortgage rates went up. But the fact is, I mean, uh, they went up very quickly after she instituted her policy. And you could say, well, it's good to take risks. You know, if, I, I can imagine interest rates shifting when John McDonnell announced a, uh, a budget. But she was announcing something which no one wanted, you know, just tax cuts for the super rich. I mean, there are some rich people that wanted it, but no one else wanted it. So she was risking people's mortgages to benefit just rich and powerful people who ended up not really having her back either. That's why it's all a bit sad. Um, Let's look at one more final clip from Liz Truss. She maintained her overall programme was correct. I believe that I've learned a lot in my time in government. I understand what some of the pitfalls are. I've been through the mill on this. And we do need to do things differently and we need to look at how we do things because whatever people's critique might be of my time in government. 
the fact is we have had relatively low economic growth for over a decade. And that has a direct impact on everybody in Britain. It has an impact on people of all incomes. And the, you know, if you look at GDP per capita, we are falling behind other countries. So there's no doubt there's a problem. And what the solution isn't, is the solution isn't, in my view, putting up taxes or restricting business more. The, the, the solution has to be about Britain growing faster and becoming more competitive. But so you, if there are other people that want to you know, put that case across, great. But didn't your premiership prove a deficit finance tax cuts are not the answer? Isn't that the model of a list trust premiership? Well, I, I don't agree that with your, the premise of your question, because what we were talking about on corporation tax is not raising corporation tax. The problem is that because we don't have, in my view, sufficiently dynamic forecasting, the prediction was that that would cost money. And it was the direct relationship of the OBR forecast with the market mm -hmm. that's the issue. And the prevailing orthodoxy which is that raising taxes increases revenue. I, and you that's, think what the, the, that's what, in my view, that's what the problem is. I mean, we already have a deficit. We already have a deficit. We already have a big debt. The question is, is the best way to deal with that debt, cutting taxes, increasing growth, or is the best way of dealing with that debt raising taxes? Now, my view is raising taxes is counterproductive, it's not actually going to lead to reducing debt in five years' time, but that, my view, is not shared by this broader orthodoxy. I think that was actually a very interesting answer there from Liz Truss, because this is where we need to be careful on the left, because I can imagine that being said by a left-wing government, but obviously replacing tax cuts with spending. So she's saying the Treasury orthodoxy, because they are into sort of accounting, they just want to make sure the spending is equal or close enough equal to the income, they don't think about the long run effects of things. And she's saying they assume that tax cuts will lose the money. But actually, what I think is that tax cuts will in the long run, make the money because it will cause growth. We on the left say, well, we think, well, I mean, we have historically over the past 12 years, um, because we've been opposing austerity, say that the Treasury think that spending cuts will necessarily um, lower the debt. But actually, that's wrong. Because if you increase spending, then that will increase growth. And then ultimately, that will increase tax revenue. So there is a bit of a mirror um, to those arguments. Obviously, I think one, the evidence in favour of spending is stronger than the evidence in favour of tax cuts. And that's particularly because rich people don't tend to spend much of their money compared to poorer people. So if you give poorer people more money, um, they're going to spend more of it than richer people. Also, if you increase spending, you get to you know, do other good things like increase equality and maybe invest in a green industrial revolution, for example. But I can see that same critique of the treasury coming from the left as from the right. I want to talk economics in just a second, but can I just be really petty and emotive Please. for one second? I didn't realise until this very moment of watching her speak to the spectator without a single ounce of self-reflection or humility that I properly loathe Liz Truss because of course we've had idiotic prime ministers in the very recent past. We've had prime ministers who only operate in the interests of financial elites, elites in the very recent past. We've, we've had prime ministers with much higher body counts in this country's recent political history. But there is something about the outsized ratio between Liz Truss's ego and Liz Truss's basic core competencies that I find utterly infuriating. And in some ways, she's she's a victim of her own lack of talent. You know what I mean? She was kind of hoisted up on high by an army of hangers on and editors in the media, particularly the Mail and the Telegraph, who saw her as a useful vehicle for their own economic agenda. And because she's essentially a narcissist, I mean, all that girl wanted was to be on the cover of Vogue, really. She even asked Nicola Sturgeon how she managed to land it. Um, you know, it, it it's that hollowness and that fundamental inadequacy and how it is rewarded 
by a dysfunctional political system, a dysfunctional media ecology, which genuinely drives me up the wall. But on the point of the economics of it, Michael, I think you're totally right to say that it's really dangerous for anybody who thinks of themselves as a leftist or socialist or progressive, or however you describe your outlook, to be uncritical in endorsing the idea that markets should be disciplining governments, all right? It's fundamentally undemocratic. Markets don't abide by democratic rules. Governments do. And ultimately, we believe um, in an idea of parliamentary sovereignty, both legally and that also it is legitimate for the electorate to express their will and have it followed through without unelected elites um, cur curtailing what's been voted for. The problem with Liz Truss, of course, is that, number one, you had a very, very narrow selectorate of Tory party members who economically and socially are really unrepresentative of the wider electorate. So you didn't have a mandate that was coming from the people. You had a real reverse ferret on the election winning manifesto of 2019, which did have a mandate. And you also had someone who was, like I said, spectacularly ill-equipped to be in charge of, well, I mean, I wouldn't put her in charge of a crash, let alone a government. Um, if you read through that 4,000 word essay in the Telegraph, she claims never to have been aware of the problem with LDIs. Um, LDIs are, of course, um, this aspect of pension funds, which are really, really sensitive to, uh, you know, rapid fluctuations in interest rates and market volatility. Now, because Liz Truss tried to push through an economic program, which was uncosted, right? This is the critical element. It was largely uncosted. It was a vibes-based economic platform. That's what led to market volatility. It helped uh, lead to the rise in interest rates, and that led to a huge destabilization of the LDIs. She claimed not to have been aware of any of that. And implicitly, she's trying to blame the Treasury. She's like, well, no one in the Treasury did their job and told me or my Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, what might happen. Now, that's in fact not true. You've had a very senior economist come out and say, actually, I did warn Kwasi Kwarteng and the Liz Trust government about the risks posed to LDIs by market volatility. And even if uh, that didn't happen immediately, you would think that Liz Trust, who really did trumpet her experience in the Treasury as a reason why she was qualified the role, that this should have been something that she was definitely on top of, that she was definitely aware of. This is like it like I said, a basic core competency. So this isn't an excuse that really, um, you know, holds any water or cuts the mustard. Um, and I think that what, what you're seeing in terms of the Telegraph and of course its sister paper, The Spectator, trying to, you know, revive some of her um, political credibility is because they really sincerely believe uh, in tax cuts for the rich. That's what they want to happen. And they know that Liz Truss has single-handedly and spectacularly discredited their personal economic orthodoxy. So they, I think, quite wrongly think that by wheeling her out again and having her, you know, bleat into the camera that it was all the OBR's fault, that it's going to sort of um, revive a bit of the political momentum for the low-tax Tories. Now, Taking a step away from the economics of it to the political case, Rishi Sunak is an exceptionally weak prime minister. He's not well liked by the public. The Conservative Party tend to fluctuate between, you know, 16 and 20 points behind Labour. Um, the public have a very, very low opinion of his government's ability to deal with uh, the problems which are facing this country, notably around cost of living and public sector pay. And within his own party, he is really quite unpopular. Uh, everybody knows that he wasn't, uh, shall we say, the Conservative Party's first choice of prom date. He was the first alternate. He just happened to be the guy that Liz Truss was running against. So he was the one brought in to try and clean up her mess. And he is in the an enviable position of being disliked by Johnson's allies for his role in Johnson's downfall, but also not really getting any of the credit for helping to bring him down. So his 
uh, base of support within the Parliamentary Conservative Party is very, very flimsy. And when you add on to that, you've got Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, who are not behaving like backbenchers. They're putting the work in to keep their profile up. They're trying to galvanize support around them. And they're sort of lurking in the wings going, is there a path back to the top job for me? Um, Liz Truss's pitch to the public might be I mean, it's it's absurd. It's risible. It's really not even worth uh, paying too much attention to, or at least don't take it that seriously. But in many ways, it's not aimed at the public. It's aimed at the Conservative Party benches to go, well, maybe I'm not as down and out. Maybe the low tax agenda isn't as down and out as everybody says it was. So think about this as a political vehicle, not a pitch to me and you. Manchester City Football Club has been charged with more than 100 breaches of the Premier League's financial rules. The club will now be subject to an independent investigation, which will look into allegations that it failed to provide, quote, accurate financial information that gives a true and fair view of the club's financial position. That information is believed to relate to club revenue, including sponsorship between 2009 and 2018. In response, Manchester City has released this statement. Manchester City is surprised by the issuing of these alleged breaches of the Premier League rules, particularly given the extensive engagement and vast amount of detailed materials that the English Premier League has been provided with. The club welcomes the review of this matter by an independent commission to impartially consider the comprehensive body of irrefutable evidence that exists in support of its position. As such, we look forward to this matter being put to rest once and for all. So they're sounding fairly defiant. It's not the first time, though, that come that the club, sorry, has come under financial security since its 2008 takeover by the United Arab Emirates. Sheikh Mansour bin Zayed Al Nainan is deputy prime minister of the UAE and brother of its president. He bought the club in September of 2008, providing it with an injection of cash. Sheikh Mansour quickly handed the reins to this man. This is Khaldun Al Mubarak, who is chairman of the club to this day, as well as holding various government jobs. Mubarak is also responsible for managing the country's sovereign wealth fund. Rolling in money, the club went on to win the FA Cup in 2011. That was its first major title and marked the end of a 35-year dry spell. It's now the richest club in the world, having topped the Deloitte Money League for the second year in a row. In 2022, it recorded revenue of £613 million. And since its takeover, it spent £2.1 billion on new players. They've also won the Premier League a bunch of times. So if you're a Manchester City supporter, you have been having a decent few years. In 2018, German newspaper Der Spiegel accused the club of trying to get around European football's financial fair play rules. The story was based on information posted on the whistleblower site Football Leaks. The club's owners were alleged to have funneled Emirati state money into the club disguised as sponsorship. In February 2020, UEFA banned Man City from the Champions League for two years and slapped it with a €30 million Euro fine. The ban was overturned later that year and the fine reduced to €10 million. Euros. The Emirates have also been accused of using the club to sports wash its reputation. Following that 2018 report, Amnesty International said this, The UAE's enormous investment in Manchester City is one of football's most brazen attempts to sports wash a country's deeply tarnished image through the glamour of the game. As a growing number of Manchester City fans will be aware, the success of the club has involved a close relationship with a country that relies on exploited migrant labour and locks up peaceful critics and human rights defenders. Christopher Davidson is a Durham University academic specialising in the politics of the Gulf. At the time of the Der Spiegel reports, he told The Guardian this, the Premier League provides an incredible international advertising platform for Abu Dhabi's state-owned entities. And by investing in football, museums and hospitals, or even East Manchester, Abu Dhabi is winning hearts and minds. Der Spiegel's reports have confirmed what many of us have known for some time, but this was inevitable once British football allowed a foreign government to buy a team, what needs to happen now, before Abu Dhabi's money kills the competition and makes football boring, is a debate about whether we let a state linked with human rights abuses invest in British football. Um, so that's a number of the controversies um, Manchester City have been involved in over the last 10 or so years since their takeover by the UAE. Ash, how significant is today's announcement from the Premier League? If you look at 
the allegations being put to Manchester City by the Premier League, it is really jaw-dropping. The allegations include 100 breaches of financial fair play rules, including, as you mentioned, disguising what's effectively state-injected money as corporate sponsorships, but also hiring one of the managers, Roberto Mancini, and giving him a secret salary that was off the books so that it would, you know, keep him uh, on side as manager. Um Now, these, if true, would be really flagrant breaches and it would undermine what flimsy, weak and inadequate governance there is in English football, European football, governing the spending of the top flight teams. I mean, you don't have to be a diehard football fan who's watching every match week in, week out to realise that the competition at a continental level is really stacked in favour of a handful of teams, many of which have managed to attract state-backed funding from somewhere, Um, teams which are really connected to sports washing in some way. And because of that kind of symbiotic relationship of we need cash, you need legitimacy, they've been able to have the best facilities, the best stadiums, the best players, uh, the best management teams, the best coaching staff. And yes, it is thrilling on those occasions in the Champions League when you get to watch a match between, say, PSG and Manchester City, you know, the equivalent of these Galactico teams where it's just so overpowered. It's like every amazing player um, on one team playing together. But what that does to the domestic league is really create two tiers of competition. You've got a fight for, you know, the top handful of places, you know, in in the UK football, that's top four, where really you're not going, who's going to be in the top four? You're really debating in what order are they going to come? And then everything else is sort of, meh, you know, neither here nor there. You know, what matters is if you're at the very top or the very bottom, so that means you get relegated. I mean, in some ways, football has become increasingly like Formula One, where it just rewards uh, corporations or states with huge amounts of money to burn and anything else just becomes almost disposable. The joy of it is lost. The idea of a pyramid of competition where anyone can rise to the top is significantly undermined. Now, I think that there are lots of ways in which you could regulate football in such a way where you do, you know, keep those star players, your, you know, your Mbappes, your um, Harry Kanes, your, um, you know, your your Messies and your Neymars. I mean, look, I know a lot of people are going to be annoyed at me for putting Harry Kane's name in there. I think there is a way where you're able to keep that talent, but you structure and regulate the financial practices of football in such a way uh, that it just stops the ability of, you know, state-backed and corporate interests from killing the competition. And there's a real irony here, Michael, that when you look at the American system of sports, whether that's the National Hockey League or the National Basketball Association or the National Football League, some of the principles that it operates on seem a lot more fair and egalitarian than the way we run football, you know, in social democratic Europe or indeed in England. One is because of the system of college sports, you have the draft. So the worst performing teams then the next season get first pick of the best players who are uh, entering professional sports for the first time. We have much tighter financial fair play regulations. And I don't think that anyone's arguing that American sports, you know, are devoid of, you know, huge salaries. I mean, you just have to look at some of the wage slips of the NBA to realize that that's not true. The problem is that in European football and also, of course, football at the international level uh, of FIFA is that it's been totally corrupted. I mean, it's almost a farce. We talked about it when it came to the World Cup. Uh, The World Cup in Qatar was essentially, you know, bought and bribed for. You've had, you know, the likes of... um, uh, of course, we had the likes of you know Seth Blatter, who 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 had covered the game 
in disgrace so crooked were some of his own practices and that's something which is filtered down uh to the national game and and you know the top leagues of every U- european country as well so i think that's the broader contextual picture for what's going on with manchester city in the short term uh of course there's going to have to be uh some kind of contestation of these charges there will be a final ruling at some point if it's you know uh not just kicked into the long grass by you know some arcane method that we know nothing of and when it comes to what the sanction might be it could be anything from a fine to uh being expelled from the league to dropping points i mean me personally i think that they should at the very least drop points and Erling Haaland should have to do a shift with every other football team um, and he never gets to play for Manchester City. I'm not sure if you understood that gag, Michael, but if you laugh appreciatively, I'm sure no one will know. No, I did get that. I know who he is. He scored okay, right, loads of goals in the first half of the season. Very tall. I think that's all I need to know. Yeah, is and a tall you know, guy who scores lots of you know goals. Who his, do you know who his father was? Was he Icelandic? Well, is. Um, no, Norwegian. Norwegian, but his dad, um, Alfie Harland, uh, basically had his career ended in a really horrible tackle. I mean, like a real leg breaker of a tackle. I think his mm. leg was broken in several places. Um, and people literally were like vomiting pitch side because it was so awful. I believe, I can't be sure, it was Roy Keane who committed the fatal tackle in the end. Wow. Um, I kind of like that guy. That. What an asshole. Rishi Sunak is prepared to take Britain out of the European Court of Human Rights if they block the government's new draconian immigration legislation. That's according to the Sunday Times, who say Sunak thinks the move may be necessary to stop asylum seekers crossing the channel. The story is based on briefings from sources close to Sunak. One of them told the Times this, The PM has been clear he wants to introduce legislation that meets our international obligations. This bill will go as far as possible within international law. We are pushing the boundaries of what is legally possible while staying within the ECHR, and we are confident that when it is tested in the courts, we will win. But if this legislation gets onto the statute book and is found to be lawful by our domestic courts, but is still being held up in Strasbourg, then we know the problem is not our legislation or our courts. If that's the case, then of course, we will be willing to reconsider whether being part of the ECHR is in the UK's long-term interests. Sunak's new bill will make it illegal to claim asylum in Britain for those who arrive here by irregular means. And that's if it goes ahead, of course. The intention is that asylum seekers who arrive via crossing the channel will be automatically deported within days, either to their country of origin or to Rwanda. Grant Shapps was asked to justify that policy on Sky. If you come here via an illegal route, so you come here to claim asylum and you know in the first place the way you're getting here is not legal, you haven't got an aeroplane, you haven't got a a commercial service, you've just been trafficked illegally, then if you come here via that route, then you you shouldn't get uh, rights. And that, I think, is quite a basic... You shouldn't get rights. You shouldn't shouldn't get rights if you're brought... if If you consent and you come here through illegal routes, what we must have is a situation where people can come here legally and claim asylum, but not illegally. Yeah, but the, I think the point is that you can't come here legally to claim yes, asylum, you can. can you? Yes, Unless you, can. you are from people with specific people routes, come here, from Ukraine, from Hong people Kong, come here from all, Afghanistan. People come here all the time and legally claim asylum when they get here. So, but the, the important thing is they haven't been people trafficked so, to get here. They, they bought a ticket to get here the rather Sunday... than being people trafficked. And people are paying for that trip, by the way, huge amounts of money uh, to the, to the yeah. gang masters. It's not they're getting here free. It's not they're coming here via that route because I'm just, it's a free I'm just way of getting here. I'm just disputing whether there is well. legal r- routes for people to come here and claim asylum legally, given you have to claim asylum in the first safe country you pass through um, to get here. Which, which, which also calls into question why it is that that hasn't already happened before people... End up That's being a different debate. People traffic. Doesn't I'm it? just questioning because whether, they could already whether there are safe violence. and legal routes for people from countries other than those. Well, two all, all I'd say is I don't think there's a country with a bigger heart when it comes to taking people in, as I say, including as it happens in my own home, bringing okay. refugees here. But you've got to have that through legal routes. Now, as to that point about no other country having a bigger heart, you just have to look at the migration statistics for the countries which who have accepted way, way more um, asylum seekers than we have and haven't made such a big deal out of it. We freak out. 
when a few thousand people crossed the channel, Germany accepted about a million asylum seekers in a year, right? So uh, there are countries with bigger hearts, trust me. The more outrageous point probably um, was him suggesting that anyone trying to cross the channel, you know, there's a simple solution. They should just get the plane. Why don't they just fly here um, like everyone else? Ash, has Grant Shapps cracked the channel crossing problem? These people should just fly here, just get the plane. Michael, I don't think that he could crack an egg, even if he was giving detailed instructions in a diagram. I mean, uh, you might be shocked to hear that he's talking total nonsense. So number one, there isn't any provision at the moment for people to claim asylum when they are not in this country, um, unless they are from a handful of other countries, including Hong Kong, Ukraine, and Afghanistan. So if you're from Eritrea or if uh, you know, you're know you from uh, Syria, for instance, um, you don't have the recourse to claim asylum when you are in a different country or if you're in your country of origin. So that would leave you two options. One is to try and come here on some kind of visa. Now, what we've seen again and again is that actually uh, the Home Office, the Border Force are very, very stingy when it comes to even tourist visas for countries where people are, you know, deemed to be absconsion risks. Now, this also is a way for the UK to make it harder for legitimate asylum seekers to get here and claim asylum. But those uh, tourist visas, which would, you know, make it possible for people to come here and then claim asylum when they get here, they're incredibly difficult to get. So if you can't get uh, asylum uh, when you are in your country of origin or elsewhere, and also your ability to get some other kind of safe and legal travel is next to impossible, then the only avenue you have open is irregular crossings. Um, it's making that a, a, an, a barrier to being able to claim asylum and regularize your status um, isn't solving the problem of a lack of safe and legal routes. All that's doing is forcing people into the shadows. Um, people will still come here by small boats. They will still come here to be reunited with their families, to seek safety, or to try and build a life for themselves in a country where they might know the language or where they might feel that there's a community that can look after them and show them the ropes. People are still going to do that. But you're forcing them into sections of the economy which are cash in hand and unregulated because you haven't given them a means to regularize their status. It's really upsetting to see how smug he is when he's saying all this, because if successful, this would have a really brutal impact on people's lives. Yeah, I was looking this up today because to my shame, I didn't actually know how one would get a tourist visa um, to the United Kingdom. Um, I haven't traveled that much outside Europe, so I don't you know, have, haven't had the experience myself. But apparently what you have to prove is that you are going to return to the country you've come from. So essentially, you, you have to provide documents to say, look, I'm up, I'm clearly only going to come to the UK for seven days. I've still got this rental contract on my flat. Um, I'm due back at work in seven days time, et cetera, et cetera. You've got, to, you've got to prove that definitively you are not going to stay in the UK. Now, obviously, if you're an asylum seeker, it, precisely what you want to do is stay in the UK. So Grant Shapps is either saying you either need to successfully commit fraud against the UK Home Office and get a fraudulent tourist visa, um, or there's no way you can claim asylum. It doesn't seem like a particularly genuine, faithful suggestion that he is making. Oh, all of these people can just get a tourist visa and, and claim asylum because, no, you you can't get a tourist visa unless you can prove that you're going to go back to the country you've, you've come from. And obviously, if you're claiming asylum, that's not what you want to do. Let's wrap up there. Um, Ash, it has been a pleasure being joined by you on the first episode of Navarra Live. Well, you know, thank you for letting me smash the metaphorical bottle of champagne on the good ship Navarra Live. Uh, for her maiden voyage. <laughs> That's very beautifully put. Um, thanks to all of you for tuning in on this Monday evening. Make sure to come back tomorrow night at 6pm when Aaron Vastani will be in the hot seat. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.